Simon, hey, how Simon. are you? Yeah, not too bad, thanks. Yeah. How are you? Not too bad. Holding up all right. Just uh, volume up. Hear me all right? Yeah, not not too bad. So it's quietish, but that's as long as you can hear me, we're good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, we're all good. I think uh, I think we're all uh, wired for sound and we're all okay at a minute. So uh, yeah, we'll have. Uh, I think we've got a few people joining in at the moment, so we'll just give them a minute cool. or so to, uh, to filter through, and then uh, we'll we'll get at it. How's that? What we've been up to at the moment? Well? Uh, yeah, but all right. Just uh, trying to use the time as best as possible, really. Not a lot we can do golfing-wise, obviously. Um, so yeah. just doing lots of uh, courses, studying from home, trying to sort of get a bit more information in the noggin, um, mm. as well as I've been enjoying doing these lives, um, just chatting to people in the industry and get a bit more information out there for people, really. Yeah, it's good fun. I remember last time around doing doing alone, it was, you say, it was just nice to do something a bit different, actually. Um, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, we're kind of looking forward to all the new stuff coming in to get all the videos out and all the reviews out, but they're kind of slowly filtering through. So hopefully we'll get, get the rest of the stuff in the next week or so and get cracking. So. Well, that's the thing. I mean, normally for this time of year, I mean, you guys are sort of testing and product testing and getting everything ready to go and getting everything set up in, in a studio. Um, so it must be strange not to be in and around and, and have that going on. It, yeah, well, it, it's nice having the time to do it, hmm. but... There's just no, we haven't got there's some stuff in, so it's um, yeah. I kind of need to wait for more to come in to get the comparisons and mm. and get sort of the relevant data. But um, yeah, good time for swing work. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> be a, I see a lot of videos of people sort of home nets and things yeah. going on, which is uh, just we're great so to lucky see. to have the studio to go to. Yeah. So workshop can stay open, but um, yeah, having a having a net to actually swing away and do do the drills and do the practice and. Get rid of some very, very old habits. It's, it's miserable. <laughs> They're persistent, aren't they? Aren't they? They're so really annoying. Persistent. <laughs> cool, good stuff. Well, what we do is I think we've got a lot of people joining in now, so we'll like, kind of get cracking. Um, so first of all, what I'd like to try and do is, if you can, is kind of um, introduce yourself a little bit, Precision Golf, talk a little bit about your sort of fitting history um, and, and the company a little bit, really. Yeah, so um, I'm one of the two co-owners of Precision Golf. Um, we're 16 years old now, um, and as history-wise, I, I like most of most of us sort of in the pro. We've been pro. I've tried to play a little bit, um, failed miserably. But in the process of going through my own equipment and testing things out, met James, who's my my business partner, and um, and he was in the club building side, and the two of us kind of it was his main idea um, to start. To, to go somewhere we can do it properly independently and he said well I need someone to fit how about it and it was really um it, it kind of pretty much sort of snowballed and, and went from there we we started up in a 1200 square foot studio over in Egham, uh, and literally had one one net uh, on one half of the building workshop up the other side James had to wait to cut shafts till I wait till I'd stop talking to someone to cut shafts um but we really we always wanted to do something completely completely independently purely uh, purely performance oriented and something where it was rather than just a kind of best match of a few bits and pieces that you could have a couple of accounts on heads and a couple of accounts on shafts we always want to be a best fit um much like going to Savile Row to a tailor you, you get one arm measured it'll be a different length to the other arm and you know your body body shape none of us are completely uniform and, and in the same way that they would trim the, the jacket or the suit to fit you that's what we've always wanted to do from a club point of view um so over the years we've managed to add add and add and add to all the accounts that we've got all the products that we've got all the technology that we use to i guess to really do our our best to assess someone's game in the in the three three and a half hours or so we have with someone and have a solution there have something we can say right this this is the best thing for you because we've tested all these these variables. We've identified this to be an issue, and this is the right route forward. And there's the data to back it up, mm. um, and do it completely without. And we we really, without sounding prevalent, we we really don't care what someone goes into as long as it's the best performing product. Yeah, and you're not there to sort of look at what's the best margin or what what we're trying to sort of no. sell at the moment. It's just the best product for that player at the time. Exactly, exactly that, yeah. Mm. Um, it, as you say, margins, are, uh, they are what they are. Um, you know, obviously we're you know, in, in business, to, I think they survive, and once we get through this, we know how busy we're going to be, and we're just so lucky to be in golf for that at the moment. But uh, mm. it, it's really, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's all about the service side of it and making sure we, mm. we do our best to maintain the highest levels on that. Yeah, 
definitely. And while we're chatting through everyone that's listening, um, if you've got any questions, chuck them in the comments box below. And like I say, as we go through, we'll either look at them in the end or if they're relevant to what we're talking about at the time, then we'll uh, we'll pick them up and, and go from there. Um, personally, for me, I think uh, I think it must be about a year or so ago that I came up to uh, to see you guys. I don't know. So it's all I disappeared flown, yeah. into a fog of time. Days <laughs> and numbers and calendars have gone out the window completely. Um, and I guess a bit of background from where I kind of got involved with you guys was that uh, as an amateur, I was lucky enough, um, looked after by TaylorMade and, and went down to their sort of tour fitting department. Mm. So everything I knew, all my equipment was absolutely perfect. And then as and when I got a new set of clubs um, through sort of standard channels, all of a sudden started to find a few discrepancies and a few odd things happening through the bag. So obviously booked in to come and come and see yourself. And I think it's kind of advertising a little bit tonight about what goes into an expert fitting, how much detail is in there, because there's a huge amount of value in having that sort of expertise and the technology and the experience of being a full time fitter than um, like anything like a, a local free fitting or something. There's going to be different levels of, of expertise in it. And it's kind of advertising really the, the value in and what a golfer can gain from having that sort of expert fit in really yeah, i think i think a lot of a lot of it is is so in everything we do there's more and more specialization every, every mm. industry every facet of every industry and i think you know golfers um is there's a lot of technology available to us now that going back when we started 16 years back there was just the start of it and go back further it was literally it used to be oh hit a few shots, we'll look at that, that looks all right, right, go with that, because mm. that was all you had to go on. But now we've got we've got machines that measure, you know, the, the bigger brothers of the launch wonders that we measure, they measure military defense technology, they measure um, missiles traveling and to pinpoint accuracy. So it's all that kind of technology that's, that's available to us now to be able to quantify the differences. So um, as you rightly said, you know, it, it's, it's a case of this, there's so much there that we can use to identify good things and bad things about equipment, but also analyze why something is different. You know, yeah. Why is it your five iron doesn't feel the same as the other? And it is, could be as simple as swing weight. It's mm -hmm. literally a scale that's been around, you know, that golf has made up this sort of strange physical way of measuring balance point uh, with random numbers and letters, but that's been around since day one, pretty mm -hmm. much. And something as simple as that can still identify why something doesn't perform the same as the rest of the set. Yeah, and, and that was one of the main reasons that I came to see you guys for. I mean, I had a problem where uh, I, I've always used a, a two iron, I've always liked having a two iron off the tee, and I uh, used a two iron where everything just kept going left on me for a little while. Really kind of struggled with it, and then um, couldn't work out why. As soon as we got it on the, the measuring device, all of a sudden then found out that uh, that the swing weight was light. Ooh, we Sorry, te slight tech issue there. Oh, that's all right, yeah. No <laughs> Sorry worries. about that. Yeah, that's all right. I'll say the, the main reason why I came to see you guys as well was, like I say, the, the issues that I had in my set. I'd, I've always been a two-iron player, and I had a two-iron that just kept going left on me, mm. and I couldn't quite work it out. And the first thing we do as well is we always go back to self. We go, oh, there must be something my swing wrong. There must be a technique issue. There must be something I'm doing here that, that must be causing it. So you're, you're videoing your swing, and you're looking at your numbers going, well, it doesn't look too far off, but they just keep losing this one left. And I found a couple of times in, in tournaments, actually, in like PJ Pro-Ams, um, I ended up losing a couple of balls out of bounds left where it's kind of, well, it cost me sort of a few shots. Um, and then as we measured it all up with yourself, found out it was uh, as much a, a degree too upright, but also it was nearly four swing weights light. And yeah. for me, the way that I was swinging, the way that I released the golf club, it just wanted just to keep going left of me. As soon as we did something as simple as uh, loft and lie check and adjusted the swing weight correctly, now it's back in play. It's not a case of most people would go straight down the, the coaching route of going, well, I need to work on this in my swing. I need to work on that. Where actually, we need to make sure we're on a level playing field to start off with. I think it absolutely is the thing is there's so many things that, the, that we as golfers can and do do wrong that the automatic assumption is, well, it, it's the arts, not the errors. There must be something that I'm hmm. doing. Um, but just getting that base information, it doesn't have to be anything massively technical, but you know, running through you know, length, loft, lie, swing weight. Right. Uh, swing weight is something that's often not, it's not particularly well 
understood because it's, it's slightly it's a weird kind of scale mm -hmm. because it's not as fixed as it seems it varies depending on the components as to what a d2 with one club will not feel the same as d2 with another club mm -hmm. so there are nuances to it that you can start halfway down a rabbit hole and, and hurt yourself badly mm -hmm. but um it's those bits that without that base information someone like yourself as a coach actually could be trying to fix something that doesn't need to be fixed by the swing mm. the literally just the physics of how the momentum of the club and you move due to dead weight and balance point that dictates how you and the club interact and therefore that that timing word that we all know about through the ball that you know one day you've got it one day you haven't well actually there's no reason why it can't be very very small variables rather than really good one day and awful the next hmm. and even uh, from feel as well i mean again going to use my own story a little bit here but with the driver the, the epic flash that i had really liked the driver numbers were really good performed really well but i remember saying to you, it just feels a little bit tinny it just doesn't quite have that solid feel to it and something as simple again of just adding a little bit more weight to, mm. to underneath the screw in the head and all of a sudden the numbers were still great but all of a sudden for me as a player because you've got that there's a human element there's a massive thing to it you've got to stand and think oh that feels nice or that looks good down at the ball um it just completely changed it just by something as simple as that really yeah, the, the I guess the, the bit that puts it into perspective as to how much little changes in, as we were talking about swing rate, that, that can make is at a 100 mile an hour club speed, which is pretty strong, but it, it's a, a good kind of strong amateur swing speed. Yeah. One gram on the head on a standard 45 inch shaft is the equivalent of one kilo of momentum and impact. So mm. all those little bits where, you know, you, the, the feel aspect of it it feels right when it complements the way you move so everything's balanced the club stays in plane better it's like any stick and ball sport it's why a pick up and a cricket bat feels good with one bat and awful with another um you know it, it's it's those elements too light like with the two iron of yours too light and as you put the power on there's not enough there's not enough mass in the club head to lag and come through in sync with how you move so you overpower and flip it left and that was the big thing that an eye opener for myself as well. I mean, obviously, being a PJ pro, we've done, our, done a lot of fitting and, and done other bits and pieces in the past. But the thing that I always found with yourself that you could pick up on straight away is what well, it seems to me is as much as you've got the data there, something you're really looking for, and correct me if I'm wrong, is how that player releases the golf club and how the shaft and everything is working together and looking for... Oh, well, again, if you've got a, a wedge of mine was too heavy, you're falling back. If the weight's pulling down, it's releasing a bit early. You're thumping it in the ground and losing ball flight rather than just adjusting the profile of potentially the shaft and, and the weight of the head. Yeah, it's, it's ultimately golf is uh, it's a power sport. It's a distance sport. And the ball, the, the distance the ball travels amplifies any, any impact error massively, which is why most golfers think they're a lot worse than they actually are. Mm -hmm. um, but it's functionally the the key thing for the golf clubs it's got to complement how you move it's got to it's got to come with you when you accelerate mm -hmm. and um i mean as I've, I've used a lot over the years is the old prep school you're too young to remember this one the, the old ss jumbo <laughs> cricket bat that that, that, that that as a 10 year old you had in the cricket the school cricket bag no one could swing it no one could hit a square cut with it because it, you couldn't you weren't strong enough to move it it was too heavy and it's exactly the same with golf is that what most players will relate to being too stiff is actually too heavy. What most players relate to being too soft is actually too light. Yeah. So it's the flex of the club has very little influence on performance, contrary to a big load of popular belief over the years. It's weight. It's timing. Um, and you flex and is what everyone in. goes to, isn't it? Flex is always the one, oh, I'm a regular flex, so oh, I'm a stiff flex, and now that'll, that'll suit me. But like you say, weight is so much more important. Mm -hmm. It's an easy one because there's a letter on every shaft or there's some kind of flex domination. And yeah. with, without the, the backup of the, the knowledge from Launchmont, Launchmont has dispelled a lot of myths over the years. They're, they're, you know, it, it's without seeing actual physical data of face angles and paths and launch angles and spins, measured data, it's easy to go, oh, well, you know, that one's gone left because we want a regular rather than a stiff. Apart from the fact that it's 10 grams light, you've overpowered it and flipped it it's it's we now know that not to be the case mm -hmm. so the most important aspect of any golf club is the weight without mm -hmm. without shadow of doubt yeah yeah 
how do you find have you found i suppose it's, it's kind of closed down a little bit with with covid and stuff but obviously the talk at the moment with longer shafts and longer driver shafts and that kind of thing of players going to you see a lot of players actually going to and actually falling back away from it for sort of how hard it is to actually strike a club consistently at, uh, at sort of 48 inches and the one that i've sort of seen that seems to have stuck with it and done well with it is um, adam scott seems to have picked up a little bit and be using a 46 and a half inch driver but what's sort of your take on uh, on the longer driver shelves so as with any club in the bag the longer it gets the harder it is to 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 keep control of and i think when you're looking at someone like adam scott has one of the purest swings that there's been yeah. for god knows how long in golf um there's 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 a give and take with it so for the pro player so Dustin Johnson has been testing a 47-inch driver. Um, he was testing it at the Masters. Uh, he gained about 10 to 15 yards, I believe, but he can't hit fairways with it as much. Mm. So for him, okay, if you hit it 350, losing 10 yards isn't the worst thing in the world. Yeah. But he's he's stuck with his traditional length driver to hit fairways. Um, he's one that, well, the best golfer in the world. Length of 47, 48 inches, those sorts of lengths. You've got to be physically very, very strong. Yeah. Um, technically very, very good. Um, of which a combination of the two is quite rare. Uh, yeah. And for the amateur golfers, we will fit more 43 and a half inch drivers than we will fit over 45 inch. Yeah. Just because definitely. you've got to find the middle of the face and you've got to square the face up. And that's yeah. something generally golfers don't do well with the driver. Hmm. So um, I think there is a, it's a passing fad. It's, yeah. it's, it's been done before. The long Tom driver that uh, I think it was Cleveland did. The Cleveland um, uh, might be Nike actually, but basically they've been, long drivers have been done in the past. Taylor May made a 46 and three quarter inch driver with the burner super fast. Mm -hmm. And it didn't, and it was awful because it went sideways. Yeah, yeah. It, it's been done before. It's just that there's a focus on it now because Bryce is doing it. And, and as you say, I mean, these guys that are experimenting with it are the best technically and the best mm. players in the world. Whereas, like I say, most guys that would come in for a fitting are struggling for contact in the face at, mm. like I say, at, at a stand of 45. So really, they're going to gain far more by finding the middle of the bat mm. than they are by having an extra couple of inches on the shelf to try and yeah. create more speed. Especially when yeah. you come to sort of accuracy as well as distance with gear affecting drivers and, and unwanted yeah. spins. And it's traditional reason why people hit the three better than the driver. It's, yeah, a bit more it's, loft, it's launch it a bit higher, get it up in the air. Yeah, um, yeah that, that's it's you. We see it from doing a gappy. You see it from pitch ridge to seven iron to five iron. Um, strike tails off as the club gets longer, um, and and the driver is no different. So yeah. it will be something that yes, we will have a couple of long shafts to test because mm. we have to. You know, yeah. it, it's something that people will want to do and you know what if we've got it then we can prove it one way or other yeah there be some people that it might well work for so mm. um but i don't it's not mainstream definitely no no mm. well we've got uh, chris harrison's got a message on here as well saying mm. uh, how long is a fitting at precision and how do you manage the player hitting enough shots to get a good amount of data but not so much that the golfer mm. feels fatigued um so i think with that it's a good time to sort of go into like i say what Let's say we come in for a fitting. Like, mm. how how does it go? How does it run for a full bag fitting? So, I mean, full full bags are you know, are a, it's a long session. You know, the it's not solid hitting, but it's between three three and a half hours. So, um, it is as you quite right to say, it's a case of managing that session time wise and how much how many swings someone's making. Um, so the first. 15, 20 minutes is getting to know someone, running through, we, we measure all your existing equipment. So um, length, loft lie, swing weight, and uh, get the base specs, the components, make sure we know exactly how they're set up because without that, you don't have a benchmark. You don't have a base point to work from. So much like we were saying earlier about, you know, playing a club and wondering whether is it the, is it the swing or is it you know, what's going on? By getting that, you we know what the clubs in their raw state are promoting. So. You can you can immediately see whether there's something that flags up as being different, and most of the time you can say how someone hits it relative to the rest of their set without seeing a swing. So that gives us a really good start point to say, right, you're you're seeing potentially result A or B based on this, um, and then you're, you're you've got a known known start point, uh, and then we'd start with irons, um, get to, and whilst we're whilst we're doing the measuring, get someone to have a little bit of a loosen up. And whilst we're doing that as well, um, try to get a picture of where this, where they feel the strengths and weaknesses are, 
what course they play at. Um, in, in some respects, people often say, oh, what handicap do you think I ought to be? The handicap side of things, someone's playing standard handicap wise is actually largely irrelevant. Mm. It's more you're looking at their ability as a golfer in terms of their swing and ball striking. Because you get some very, very good ball strikers who play off 15. Yeah. Finished a couple of doubles and, and some it, but they're a much really, better player. Yeah, really quirky swings that get it around in 72 every time. So it, it's it's largely the kind of the handicap thing is not something we focus on largely. We might ask because it's a, you know, yeah, it's part, still part of it, but it's not something we pay a lot of attention to. Um, but then, yeah, then, then you're into kind of capturing data with existing clubs. So we start with the, start with the iron, start with the six iron once it's loosened up, get some base data there look at what's happening, look at launch and spins and ball speeds uh, relative to club speed um, and tie that into how the equipment's set up. So the, the specs that we get from the existing clubs will, alongside the swing data and the shot data, form the picture of why everything's happening as it is on the course. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we're saying, right, this works well, this doesn't work well, this can be improved uh, in order to get more control into greens we need to get more spin or more flight or if you're too high too spinny we can get more efficiency by bringing that down and, and just then saying right we, we need to target this this particular part of that bit of the equipment and from there we're then formulating kind of whether is it head is it shaft um and basically going through the process of finding out what is going to so shaft from a timing point of view, what is going to tie that timing and strike together as much as possible from a mm. weighting and a strike point of view, balance point point of view. Once we get that, we, we like to do shaft first, then head. Because once you get the shaft right, you've got the timing. Once you've got the timing, you've got what I call a kind of true picture of ball flight mm. with, no, with as little compensation and manipulation of the impact as possible. And then you're using head to manage forgiveness and ball flight. You know, and I think the big thing as well, like for yourself, is that um, if you're an indoor fitting studio like you are, it's much easier to do. You can't really do with an open range so much. Is being fit with the ball that you play. Something as simple as that. I mean, how many people like your weekend warriors go out and what time, whatever's in the bag, I'll play with that today and wonder why their game might be inconsistent. And one week they've got a Pro V1, the next week they've got a top flight and they're getting different results. Whereas you go in and say, right, this is the ball that I play. I'm going to mm. get fit with that golf ball so that everything is optimised for them. Yeah, I think, I think well, A, you're right just from an advice point of view because so what's the best golf ball to use? And you just say, well, one, number one, a consistent one. It um, doesn't have to be a 50 pounds a dozen Pro V1 style ball. It, you, know, you probably find you get better performance not using a one-piece one piece bargain bucket effort. But actually, yeah. just number one is consistency. But yeah, yeah if um, you know, we would start off testing with the ball that someone's using or if it's if it's something that we don't have in like some, those just low stock or if it's something like a vice we might have exactly the same ball and we'll use something very very similar mm. um as a benchmark and again you're then looking at can we improve performance or optimize ball flight or playability through the ball as well so that forms a part of the overall session but mm. you're fitting with a with a proper golf ball is i mean things like the range balls aren't hideously inconsistent with performance they're just not right they don't yeah. give true ball flight and spin performance because of the durability that they've got to have on a range versus yeah. on a golf course. So, and yeah, especially it, when it, you're looking into sort of drivers and wedges, both ends of the bag, really, where spin's yeah. really, really important. How your wedge is launching and the, the spin that's coming off it, because obviously a harder range ball is going to pop up higher with less spin. Um, yeah. And then again, when you try and optimize driver, it's, it's a really important thing. I mean, spin. Like there's a whole thing about high launch and low spin, really. But yeah. spin is at the you know, average average golfer. Sorry, spins their friend. Spins keeping the ball up in yeah. the air. Yeah, there are there are kind of windows you want to work within, yeah. and um, as you say, with the range balls, the cover's so hard. If you take and you hit a wedge shot with it, the amount of times that that you you look for your normal ball flight with the range ball and then go, like yeah, that, because <laughs> the, the cover's so firm it doesn't grip. So yeah. you literally it launch, and we've seen we've done some testing with it, and uh, and a. Uh, a kind of range ball or even just a, a, a distance ball can launch as much as 10 degrees higher and spin less than half the amount of a premium ball. So it's vast difference, vast yeah, difference. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. So um, the other thing I think with uh, fitting is, and especially for fitting, like say expert fitting like yourself, is 
the kind of misconception that, oh, it's only for better players. It doesn't really affect me. I'm only a 22 handicap. I've got nothing to gain from that. Or actually, it's completely opposite. Yeah. And I think you'd agree, like I say, that if you're the the more, let's say, sort of average to high handicap golfer, has far more to gain from something yeah. that's going to perform from them. Because I would say as well, a, a better player is good enough if you like to kind of find impact or kind of make it work and adjust the equipment they've got whereas say a higher handicap might not be able to do that it, it, exactly that you, you hit it absolutely on the head it is you feel you're taking you know, someone like yourself it's real fine tunes so you're good enough but also confident enough in your own abilities to go that's not me that's not me there's something with the club so what you tend to find is the better the player is the closer to broadly speaking what they need they tend to get because there are certain correlations that you're expecting to see in ball flight relative to what you're doing. And you trust your ability to, to know that, well, that, that, was, that was not the swing I made. Mm. And you go to the other end of the spectrum and then you, you, you hear a high handicap who goes, well, I don't play enough or I'm just not good enough. Or, you know, or you know, they just have a low opinion of their game, mm. which makes them blame everything on themselves. And, and you just say they, they don't necessarily have the ability to manipulate their game to find contact or to manage their way around the golf course with it. So, or they're just playing fundamentally something completely wrong um, because it's just been in the bag for 10 years and what well, kind of works once every 10 times. So or been passed down or, or, or yeah. to a degree as well. Let's say someone uh, potentially that's kind of sort of, we're all getting older, but sort of moving. They might have had, had a driver they had when they were 55 and now they're kind of 70, 75. Mm. They're going to put completely different force and, and different movement yeah. to it. And also for that player, really you go down the coaching route to try and hit the ball longer or straighter or launch it higher let's say they've got a 10 of nine degree driver with a stiff flex yeah. and now like i say they're not they're not created enough speed and they might have a yeah. out to in downward of attack angle for them they're not gonna really be looking to change their golf swing they just want to get more yeah. enjoyment out of the game and to me like lessons and fitting is all for that that game it is enjoyment of the game at the end of the day and all of a sudden they're going to benefit so much more from having a like say a, an expert fitting uh, to get the most out of their drives and get them ball launching up in the air and down the fairway rather than going oh you know I can't carry the header on that hole because it always comes out low I can't get the ball up in the air I need to go and have a uh, have a lesson to try and hit it further yeah it's like the, the old the old thing but like with irons as well yeah, they've got an old set of I don't know, let's say type is DCI blacks with a dynamic gold in it, which is the heaviest steel shaft out there at 130 mm. grams. There are now shafts down at 45 grams in arms. Mm. So it's, it, it can be, and heads that are miles more forgiving. The, the, it is also that sort of, if you've had a, something like a driver for 15 years, there is so much more technology out there. Mm. You know, these drivers now are, or just fairway woods, irons, everything, there is so much more forgiving. And, um, and the shaft technology has moved on so much that you can, you can have pretty much your cake and eat it with the setup now. It's you can get the club really working for you rather than having to battle it. Um, yeah. So, I mean, a, a club in a lot of instances is a good word to use because it is like kind of caveman club. Some of the weight side of it that uh, old clubs used to be. I think back to some of the stuff I use, and I got elbows hurt just thinking about it. But yeah, um, it, yeah there, there's so many tools out there to help, as you say, enjoy your game more. And, and mm. yeah, as you say landing short in the heather is no fun whatever yeah. age, whatever standard you are. Um, and it's a percentage wise, there's far more gain for the higher handicap, but yeah. by a long shot, by a long yeah. shot. And one of the great services you guys offer as well is the fact of having, having the workshop. And like mm. I say, a lot of the time, it's not just about buying a brand new set of clubs. It's about getting the clubs that you've got to work more efficiently. I know with myself and some other guys that I've uh, recommended to you, it, it is a case of the equipment that they've got just isn't quite working and needs a change. And you've got the workshop there to do it. And one of the big things that I've had done with my own clubs, and I know it's a big difference, is the um, SST Pure and having the, the shafts peeled. Yeah, it's this kind of technology that's, that's over the years, it's had, I guess, mixed understanding of what it does. It's, it's a bit like bouncing a car wheel. You know, it's shafts, there, there are thousands, tens of thousands made by each manufacturer every day. Um, so there are in just inherent tolerances in there. Steel isn't straight and, and graphite, you've got a mixture of different multi-material constructions now, resins, you know, all these sort of things where they're straighter than steel, but there are structural variables. And then once you trim them, you're changing that up again. So really what you're doing is, in, what, as a technology, what it does is it ensures the shaft is installed in its most stable place in the club head from a, a 360 degree rotation point of view. So it means the logo might come out anywhere, 
but um, you know, it, it's it's something that Tiger Woods has done for a long time. Uh, Rory McIlroy got some stuff done on the tour van last week. Um, you know, the, the top players are doing it, but they're just not paid by them, so you don't hear about it. Um, yeah, yeah. There's, there are an awful lot of players over the years who who have done it, um, and it's not a critique on the on the shaft companies either. No, no. It's just recognizing that they make thousands of them, so there are inherent tolerances and and variables shaft to shaft. Um, and so, that's the same thing as well with with buying new clubs. I mean, something yeah. I always find I think is is a really good if you're buying a, a set of golf clubs, obviously from yourself, it'll already be done, or from uh, a PJ Pro. Is I think everyone the tendency always been, and when I was sort of working the shop a little bit more and an assistant pro is, oh, we'll leave them in the wrapper because then it's a lovely thing yeah. for the client to unwrap, which is, which is it is it's fantastic. Yeah. But at the same point, like I say, manufacturing has tolerances. So what to, what they might say, they might I think it's generally a degree or so, might be a degree or so off. And again, a discrepancy that I found with, with my set was the fact that my four or five and six iron were meant to be 22, 25 and 29 degrees. And when we measured them, they were 23, 24 and 30. Mm. Now, yeah. they're within tolerance. They're one degree yeah. as to what mm. they should be. But I've got a four and a five iron that's the same weapon. And then I've got a six degree gap all the way to the six irons. And now I've, you know, there's, there's gaps in the bag. And something that's yeah. uh, really worth doing is, like I say, having them checked, getting them checked as, as sort of, mm. like I say, part of a service before they go into, into the client's hands, really. Yeah, and I mean it's something that, that I mean that's something that work that changes over time as well. If you've got a, a softer forge head, then they will just move. Especially if, if someone's if you've got a particular practice club, I, I always always advise don't have a particular practice club because if you're you know, if you're giving one club a pounding, it will it will change and move. So it's best to spread it through the set. But yeah, it, it's worth checking once a year because yeah. um, it's it's something that you you could without realizing things can shift and move. It's it's there's a lot of force going into those clubs. So. Um, especially when the ground gets hard in summer, it, it's it's like hitting off a mat, a, a hard rubber mat every time. You know, there, there's a lot of stress on that ozzle, um, mm. and yeah, it's it's so those little bits that actually say one degree out either way. If they've both gone divergent ways, then you've got a very small gap at one end, and then a massive gap afterwards. And then yeah, yeah. again, the golfer goes, hmm, maybe I didn't hit that seven on as well as I thought I had. It's come up half a club short, or yeah. I've oh, crushed that six iron, that's gone miles. Um, yeah. And then why can't I hit my five iron further? So again, we'll we'll blame ourselves for it, but actually it can just be, I say that slight tolerance coming out of the factory or yeah. just natural usage. And I think what you get is like I say, these sort of, all the technology like we said with SST and, and with everything done, the swing weighting, it is all about just cutting down those variables mm. and trying to make the player's game as consistent and as repetitive as possible. Yeah, and that's, I think, as you said, the key of having the workshop on site um, mm. is that you know, we, we get all the components in and we build them on site. So we are 100% culpable and can take ownership of the whole process. So you know, we're not reliant on someone else putting anything together for us. So um, it, it allows us to go from literally from the, the moment someone walks in to the moment they walk out with their clubs, we're completely in control of that. And because we've got couple of club builders who make tens of clubs a day the attention to detail and the time afforded on the set can be that much more we can mm. you know we can find ways of you know adding a little bit of weight here or there doing a little bit of a grind it's like with your your wedges i mean todd is yeah todd is one of the most sensitive men i know the wedge head weight um, yeah, and, <laughs> and you know what it can be you know, it can be done that you know mm. there, there are ways of of you know, even if it's like we had to revisit one a little bit because it came out slightly heavier than we wanted to. And, you know, it, there there are ways of making it making it happen. It might need a little bit of a grind here or drill a little bit of weight out of the hosel there. But, um, yeah, when you've got it there on site, you're not having to send things off. And, and you can then look and go, OK, the dead weight's X, the swing weight's Y. Um, the old club was A and B. And, OK, we need to make a little tweak here. And, and, and it's it gives you, it affords you the versatility to do it, mm. which is which is great. Yeah, and again, you you can you can test on site. You can change it, alter it on site, change it a little bit, and then, like I say, go away to to build, and mm. and off you go from there. I mean, another thing that I think um, gets overlooked sometimes is the effect that changing grip has mm. on swing weight. I mean, like I say, you generally you might say, yeah, like I say, go into a pro shop. Oh, I want to go try some jumbo grips because they feel really nice, and all of a sudden you go from a standard to a, a jumbo. 
um, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, they feel really good, but I just can't quite get them. I can't quite hit them. I mean, how, how, what is the the figure? I think I heard somewhere was it sort of six, seven swing weights. It can be massive, yeah. I mean, there's if you take a standard black golf pride tall velvet grip at 52 53 grams um or even like any pretty much any any grip like lambkin cross line um mm. the it's interesting the tall velvet midsize doesn't really change weight it's a couple of grams difference 55 56 the lambkin midsize is about 64 uh, so another 10 grams on top which is a couple of points less than the club head uh mm. If you then go to the Lampkin oversize, that's then about 80 grams. So, you yeah, cool. grams. so you're putting an extra 25, 30 grams counterweighted. So you've then to, to get the swing weight back, which wouldn't feel the same anyway, but you've got to then add, let me see if it's 30 grams, six points, you've got another 10, 12 grams into the head again. So all of a sudden you're 40 grams heavier in the club. Hmm. So it's, it's those sort of knock-on effects that, uh, or if you go the other way, you put a multi-compound on, it's a bit lighter and it's got a grip cap and suddenly swing it goes up two, three points. So it's all those little bits, as you say, you just wouldn't think, well, it's just a bit of rubber, really. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, mean, I, had, I had an inquiry from someone recently about, you know, I, I, you know, got a bit of arthritis in the hands and wanted to go to a jumbo. I was like, mm, maybe not quite that big. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it can have a huge effect. Um, and, and even from a fitting point of view, that there are some players that are really sensitive to dead weight. And just putting that extra eight to 10 grams in the mid-size grip, you have to sometimes be really careful of using a grip weight that doesn't, doesn't push dead weight up too much. Mm. Um, so that, that can have really massive effects on timing. Yeah. Mm. And there's a, a question I just said on here as well. Uh, the best way to know the size of grip to use or how many takes to apply. So what would you say? Is it uh, sort of feel or personal preference or would you say a, a chart necessarily for sort of hand size to grip size? It's a size? bit of both. It's a bit of both. I think there's, um, I like Ernie Els is big and he used like a standard for a long time. He's a standard grip size with one extra take and you'd think he'd be in a midsize or something like that. There's, <clears throat> there's, it's a mixture of theory and practice with grips. I think you've got, um, as a general rule, I mean, standard size, standard grip, one layer is actually fairly small. Um, so the difference between a standard grip and a midsize grip, if you were to just use layers of tape, is about seven. Uh, so it's a lot more than people might think, or adding one layer of tape, you'll feel it, but it doesn't make a massive difference. To make a really notable difference, you've got to add at least two or three layers to make it really feel noticeably larger in the hands or change a, a kind of a hand pattern for impact or anything like that. Um, I think in the main, uh, it's, there, there are charts. Um, I, guess, I guess to a point, because I've done it on how the grip fits in someone's hands for so long, I've got used to not using those charts anymore. I mean, yeah. yes, if you got to like a, a if you had a, a small glove, you're going to be probably one or two layers. If you got to a medium, you're going to be three or four layers. Medium, large, you're verging on a mid size. As a really broad ranging, but that's that's kind of a very broad pattern of it. But you've then got you know, sometimes just like a bigger grip feel. I've got a you know, international hockey player who's a client of ours, and he plays a mid size, even though he's got small hands. He's just used to. Hockey, hockey stick handling this. Yeah. There's, you can form a lot of habits with grip sizes. Ultimately, yeah. as long as it's not ridiculous, it's got to feel, it's got to feel comfortable. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think we're, there's, we're tending towards. I think from where the swings change to be more, more body oriented and quieter hands. Mm. There are a lot of the plus four grips or the kind of reduced taper grips. Um, so Lamkin have got their, they call it kind of sonar standard plus. Um, let's see, Golf Pride have got the plus fours. Um, I don't see Bryson takes it to extreme with the Jumbo Max, but taking that taper out keeps left and right hand more neutral. So it takes out that kind of a little bit more tendency for the right, you know, for bottom hand, sorry, I've been very right hand, is the, yeah. um, for the bottom hand to be a little bit, little bit faster through impact. So that's a, going more body oriented on swing technique affords you to go a little bit bigger on the grip because mm. you don't need your hands to do as much. So um, I've always missed left, so I prefer a bigger bottom hand. It, it kind of, yeah. there, are, there are definite base points to start from, and then you kind of move into grip texture and size as sort of mm. managing feel and comfort from a, I guess, a, a sensible base point on sizing. So yeah, if, if I think the first bit probably give a kind of a start point on sizing, if that helps. Yeah. 
And like you say there, it, I think it's it very um, dependent on how the player releases a golf club and, and mm-hmm. the feel they need. Like I say, if someone's in there and they've got a lot of hand action, now if they're reliant on that, you take that away and they're going to really struggle to strike it. Yeah. They might say, oh, I want to quieten it down. Well, actually, that's your game. That's how you find the ball. So that's a big key to your your golf game. And I think um, as well with fitting across the board, it's not, uh, oh, if, if, let's say like, I want to get more swing speed. We need to go to a lighter shaft. Mm. Doesn't always work like that. It is very, very much throughout all fitting is is trial and error. It's what works for that player. It is. It is. It is educated guesswork. It's it's mm. educated. It's guesswork from a point of knowing what each variant's going to do. And it's mm. either going to have it's either good, bad. I always like the flow diagram where you go, does it work? Yes, no. It's kind of like that. You you yeah. you know the variables that you're working with but we are all going to react differently to them. Um, and okay, there are extremes that you, you are rarely going to go to, but within the parameters and the player style and the, the player's technique that you're looking at, yeah, you, you, you've ultimately is a guess, but you've got to try something to know whether it's a good or a bad change. And whichever one it is, you either keep going down that route or you go, right, well, we, that didn't work, but we know why most importantly. Um, yeah. And yeah, it, it's, it's the, the, I guess the more time you get with the player, the more you understand them. So kind of repeat clients, we know really well now. And, and you know, they can say, well, shall I try this? And just go, no. Or yeah. yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, I guess, the key thing. It's a real two-way relationship. It's not a case of coming in and dictating to someone what they're going to what they're gonna play. Um, you have to be sympathetic to them as a, I guess, player and character and sort of personality, how they approach the game, all those sort of bits. It all goes in the melting pot. Mm. I had uh, going back to wedge fitting a little bit here, mm. sort of. Uh, so, sort of, how do you go about your wedge fitting process? And also, um, Chris has put in there as well. So, sort of how do you go about a wedge fitting process indoors? Uh, and mm. what sort of track man parameters are you mainly looking at when you're doing wedge fitting? I mean, is it mainly how do you go about grind and, and bounce fitting and, and the importance of it, really? Uh, I mean, huge importance for one. Um, I mean, wedge fitting is so you you start with a kind of a base where you're kind of pitch wedge distances. Um, so if someone came in specifically for wedge fitting rather than part of a fullback bit, we're looking at, right, where, where's their pitch wedge? That's the kind of the, the top end. That's where we're starting from. Um, you've got to understand someone's regular course they play and therefore conditions they're playing in. So, mm-hmm. you know, is it a London clay that this time of year is going to be a soggy mess and then briefly, <laughs> briefly firm in summer? Yeah. Um, is it Lynx turf? With kind of tighter firmer turf, softer sand, because that all those those bits all go into what tools you're going to need. To I mean, that's the thing in the UK we get is such varying conditions. Yeah. Um, you get not just course to course, but season to season. So you've got to have the armory to deal with that uh, as best as possible. So um, you looking at the so pitchers to start with, and then. A, kind of how does someone see their short game? You know, there are, there's no absolute right or wrong. There are just lots of different ways of getting the ball close to the pin from 100 yards in. Um, so trying to understand the type of shot someone likes to see. Are they someone who likes to see the ball come in lower? Are they more just trying to take standard swings? Are they someone who, who really kind of feels around and manipulates shots around? Um, you know, it's there are certain shots that you know you 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 play particularly where you work the club bits under nicely. You know, hence not letting the headway get heavy because you really kind of whip the club head through. It's very much mm. you you use your hands to work the club face and to work the bounce and to work the loft a lot. Um, so all those bits go into kind of formulating a picture of how someone plays their game and the conditions they regularly play in. Mm. Uh, and then from there, it's there are generally speaking a couple of routes you can go in terms of. Do you have a bit more armory and more options down the bottom end, or do you keep it simple and keep it to kind of pitch wedge, front base of gaps, gap slash sand wedge, and then sand slash lob wedge? Uh, so you've just got clarity as to right, it's definitely that one or that one. Um, so it, it's it's yeah, it, it's there's there's no exact formula for it. I guess like any fitting, there's no exact formula for it mm. because we all play shots a different way. Um, we all kind of work the club through differently for the short game shots in particular. Um, and it's often dictated to by the conditions we play regularly. So, mm. um, so again, going long winded on answers here, but um, <laughs> the, so the loft fitting is based on how many clubs does someone want to play and what are, what are workable gaps within that? Mm. Um, 
and then a bit of the ball flight side of things. So someone might want the extra wedge, but doesn't want to see it go straight up in the air. So you kind of go, for example, 58 rather than 60, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, bounce fitting is really looking at, so that a bit of it is looking at how someone delivers the club. But are they someone who, like I've always been a bit kind of um, shove the handle forward, steep, laggy, uh, poor short game. Um, <laughs> um, when you get that wet London clay as well, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, why, that's why I've loved Linscott. You can pinch it against the turn. Yeah. Um, but um, so you, someone like that, you're going to need more bounce. You're going to need protection on the back edge. You get someone who's really kind of quiet arms, body rotation, shallower into the back of the ball, kind of really skids the club shallower across the back, across the turf. You don't need as much bounce from. So again, you've got sort of parameters there straight away from technique. Um, over here, we've got to have the variety of bounces. So if you're playing an extra wedge, it affords you to go a bit more bounce on one and a bit less on another. Mm. Um, so we generally play a curve a bit more on a sandwich, a bit less on, a, on the lob wedge, mm. um, because you can then achieve similar lofts and massively different bounce conditions. Mm. Um, or the extravagant way is to have two sets of wedges, but that's yeah. obviously an extravagant way of doing it. Yeah. Um, it's fine if you're a tour player and it's free. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then a bit of the other bit with bounce is you have to use a you have to use some form of strike some some form of way of determining strike point on the sole. So yeah. generally, it's it's. I mean, if you're on turf outside, you can look at divot patterns. You can look at divot depths. Um, for us, actually, as much as live boards can be a little horrible, we don't actually use the live board to determine the live fit. We actually use them for wedge fitting because yeah. you can put a put a, a mark on the sole of the wedge or a bit of tape on the sole of the wedge get someone to hit different shot types and look at where does that change the strike point? Is it, is it center of the wedge, front edge, back edge, heel? And that determines how you've got to shape the sole to facilitate yeah. playing the different shot types. So and which part of the bounce is being most used so you can then work the grind yeah. around that as well. And the other exactly. thing I think as well that's really important with wedges when you look at the difference between the bounce of a, a lob wedge compared to say a, a 54 or a sandwich yeah. is uh, personally from like a playing point of view is the lob wedge is going to be opened up a lot more. You're going to be exposing more bounce. So you want less in there anyway, so you're not blading it. But then when you come into your sand wedge, a lot of those are going to be those kind of 80, 90 yard pitch shots or actually strike location up the face is really important. So you have a bit more bounce, mm. lowers the strike location to give you that kind of low launch, more spin friction as opposed to something that's coming in, striking high in the face and just popping up in the air dead. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's where, I mean, over the years, people have said you bounce is your friend, and and it always used to be like the old the old Vokey four degree, you know, L grind used to be four degrees, which is scary. Yeah. Um, and actually, you can you can use bounce to regulate strike. So actually, the best wedge players in the world will use the sole of the club. They're not trying to get the leading edge into the back of the ball. They're trying to use the the center center or back half of the wedge to gauge strike depth. So actually, you know, it, it's not, you don't have to be as accurate on strike if you do that. You can catch it a centimetre behind the ball and still get a reasonable shot if you're using the bounce the right way. Now, granted, that's technique, but um, width of bounce is also a really key, key aspect of that. Um, you can play a wider sole shape than most players think they can and still get a nice, neat shot off a tight line, hmm. um, if you trust it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but it must have been great because didn't you spend a bit of time uh, with Roger Cleveland as well, didn't you, when you were out in, in the States? Yeah, I did a, I've done a couple of interviews with him. Actually, did a really, really good one. I called him Bob at the end of the interview once. So <laughs> um, yeah, he, he was utter pro, just just glossed, glossed right over it. But yeah, to, to have the opportunity to talk to guys like him and you know, Sean Toulon on putters, um, you know, Bob Vokey, Alan Hocknell, who's the Callaway head designer, those guys getting getting a chance to speak to them. I mean, they're so enthusiastic about it. You'd think after so many years in the game, they'd, they'd just churn out the same conversations over and over again. Yeah. But um, these guys love finding something new. And mm. there are so many years worth of working with the best players in the world, which granted, not everything that they do is relevant to your club golfer, your average golfer, but actually they can learn so much about how it works and little, little changes here and there about a bit of, you know, five mils and soul width or graduation on progression of bounce something like that will will just lead to such better products down the line and he, he's just so so enthusiastic about just a slight change in in groove pattern on the face uh, and the little changes that it can make it, it's a, a fascinating people um, and mm. to get one-on-one -on -one with them is just is great yeah 
Yeah, definitely. And again, that comes into what we said about the expertise and the extra knowledge that goes into into a lot of uh, fittings that, like I say, many other people and most other people wouldn't have access to, really. Yeah, very fortunate to have uh, owned this, um, this last year or last, yeah, this year, um, we went last year to, to be able to get out to, to go to the PGA show, uh, which I think potentially could be a very different format down the line. But to have had so many, had 15, 16 years in a row of going out there and, and having access similar to that um it's you just absorb so much out of it and um to ask the people who really don't market the product who design it that's that's Mm -hmm. when you can get the really good answers yeah yeah Um, Yeah. it's yeah invaluable invaluable yeah Yeah, it's not just a sales pitch it's kind of from the the actual inventor yeah yeah and they're happy to answer any question they they always Mm -hmm. say there's no dumb question because if you're asking it there's a reason for asking it so it's, it's trying not to be Try not to get tongue tied and call them the wrong name, yeah. and, uh, and just kind of just just ask. Yeah, yeah. And it's the same. We also have people coming in it, to see us. It actually, it's, it's much about learning about it because if you if you can understand more about what's being done, you can get more out of it down the line. You yeah. can If you can understand the process, then probably the biggest compliment people say when they leave is, oh, "I've really learned a lot today," um, mm. and and that's a big part of it. Definitely, and I think that's the big thing as well. That. Like I say, speak to people. You've got three and a half hours there with mm. uh, an expert such as yourself. I would say, pick your pick your brains. Mm. Just ask all the questions. Try you're using it actually, not just for fitting, but as coaching as well. Mm. Learning more, learning more about why that makes the club better. How your clubs are, are built for you. It not only sets some impression makes when you go and play on a Saturday because you've got all this extra knowledge. And my club does this because of so and so. But at the same point, it's it's pick it. Like I say, it's getting extra knowledge. Yeah. And, and it helps actually then the knock-on effect is then when they go back to work with their coach or like yourself is that if, if they've understood why something has changed mm. then actually it, it can then lead it into getting more out of the lessons as well you know it, it's yeah, such yeah. a um it, it all feeds into the same same parts the better job we do the easier the better job you can do you know and vice versa uh, and it really is you know having you know, people like yourself who we can communicate with you can say right this chat's coming down i'm we'd like to look at this bit because we think this might be happening or it, it, it allows you to get so much more knowledge and so much more so much a better service for the golfer because mm-hmm. you've got the the two key sides the coaching and the clubs working together rather than just completely completely separately with no no communication yeah and i think for me for both for a player and for a coaching point of view once once you know that it's kind of like right the clubs are perfect that's signed off okay mm-hmm. now i've got a real good uh, sort of solid blank canvas to kind of work with i know that mm. this is going to be more swing mechanics now rather than any discrepancy that's going to go on with with any equipment yeah not you're not fighting anything you're just no. playing at that point yeah no mm. uh, we had a question in as well about mm. the potential for integration with strokes gained into fitting and how that would come in um do you want to sort of uh, what's your opinion on i think that? it's something that yeah i think i think it's something that we're just scratching the surface of at the moment. I think it, it's there will be a point where, um, I, for example, we take the the kind of the systems that have it now. It, it's it's very going to be very similar for both coaches and fitters to be able to log in to someone's data and then get a picture before they even have seen them of what their game's like. So um, I think what you what you get is a truer sense of what someone's actual game's like. Um, yeah, and we've all, I'm sure we all have a, this idea of where our misses are or the distances we hit or all of that going oh yeah i just didn't hold any putts and probably missed nine greens and that's why you haven't scored very well um but to actually get access to real on course data before someone comes in so it just it'll make everything that much more efficient uh i think we're we're getting there i think um it's something that the where they're now getting to in the functionality and the data analysis now we're probably got to try and think how long they've been going now. Like quite, it's it's a good while now. But the yeah. the the amount of apps and the, the 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 development in that side of the tech, I think, is soon to be very 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 useful. Um, hmm. re- you're really useful in in di- just diagnostics on someone's game. Yeah, and it's the same from coaching point of view to a fitting point of view. I think for me, where I'd look at strokes gain and how that would be integrated is finding, like I say, those potential problem clubs that hmm. that could be slightly off mm. i mean what would if, if we're sort of looking for people that are listening along what would you say would be the main uh, kind of key signs that their fit their clubs might not be 
fit for them? What what would you that sort of things to look out for if you like? Inconsistent distances for one, that that for sure. Um, yeah. If you've got or if you've got say a club that you hit particularly well and like a standout club from a good point of view, then it either means that you've got one very good club and, and twelve or thirteen other rotters. Um, but I think having because you're looking for a balance ultimately through the through the set. So if either you've got a directional miss uh, in particular with one or a part of the bag that doesn't match the other part because generally if you're swinging it broadly speaking the same you should have the same kind of shot pattern ideally mm -hmm. through the set um that or the or the distance gaps if there's a if there's a, a big hole in the set then either you're you've not got an appropriate club or you're missing a club and then within for example a set of irons if you've got um kind of compressing of yardages at the top end or mm -hmm. just inconsistent gaps Th those are the the very standout mm -hmm. keys to look at yeah. Cool. And then uh, another question you got in as well was about um, when getting driver fittings, yeah. uh, is there an optimum launch angle and spin combination that would be the same for every golfer or is every golfer going to be slightly different? The latter. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's um, because it, what the optimal window depends on how you deliver the club. Is. So, um, for example, if you've got someone like Henrik Stenson who hits down his driver and shoves his hands forward and de-lofts it massively, he's going to be a totally different flight window to McElroy who hits up on it five degrees. So um, there are, like Pinger published a really good chart on angle of attack, club speed, mm. and what optimal launch and spins are. Um, and it will vary based on club speed. It will vary based on technique. Um, so, mm. yeah, if you're a low launch, you need more spin to keep it in the air. If you're really high launch, you need less spin to keep it going forward. So it's a real kind of sliding scale for launch and spin. Yeah. yeah. So when we look at uh, sort of the uh, the products stopped at uh, Precision, I mean, how many brands would you say that you're you're dealing with? Uh, upwards of sort of of probably. And... Uh, I think in club head brands, we're looking at uh, twelve to fifteen. Uh, the, the major brands. There are some niche ones as well, so probably up to fifteen. I mean, shaft brands around 10. Uh, in terms of variables, we've got uh, on the wall for driver shafts alone, we've got a couple of hundred, uh, which are not necessarily different models, but there are flexes within models in that range. Um, and then iron shafts, another couple of hundred. So yeah, it's vast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the great thing about it is, is the fact that everything fits into everything. It's sort of, it's yeah. not a case of like, generally, you can go to, let's say, a stockist and let's say Callaway for example they've got their stock three or four different shafts that go in with that driver and you're trying to find like you might have one different weight option different flex options going through there whereas for yourself you can say well no no hang on let's try this you've got everything fits into everything so the, the possible combinations are through the roof yeah I mean um, uh, drivers you, you've got interchangeable hosels so you've got a one a it's better for us we've got one bank of shafts but it, you can isolate you can isolate bits so you can say right we know that shaft performs well we know that head performs well mm. what do we need to change to optimize it and you you know the exact variable you're changing um, mm. so you know we've had to integrate some slightly different tech for the, the fixed fairway woods I like guess some are adjustable some are fixed so we're kind of adding adding a little bit into that but um mm. But yeah, it's it's great to be able to say right. We know, we know by changing this bit that that happened, uh, and we can be yeah. very very definite with that. So yeah, mm. having not having to go through different builds of three heads with that shaft, well that shaft should work in that head kind of thing. That's that's what it was like in the in the old days. Um, it, it's been yeah huge to be able to isolate performance characteristics. Yeah. Mm. And the fact of yourself, like I say, where you're a full-time expert, uh, expert fitter in the fact that you've got a catalogue of people that you've worked with and you know how a certain shaft have performed when testing with lots of different players. So if you're mm. looking for a potential fix, then you know, okay, well, this shaft has this tendency or this flex point and this is how it's weighted. This mm. is going to work really well for that, tr that kind of launch parameter I'm trying to change. Yeah, and, and you get to know there are some shafts that are very, very good with very specific swing styles and others that, mm. are, that will perform similarly across every kind of swing. So, you know, similarly, certain heads that are a bit better out the heel or a bit better out the toe or lower on the face, higher on the face, um, because we've, we've seen so many different people hit them um, that you, you, you really start to <clears> get a picture up of why a head or where a head is really going to suit a particular player style as well. So. Uh, yeah. And I know I've got a month to test them all, so at least, uh, at least yeah. for my swing, I'll know uh, I should get a good... Well, you've got the swing dialed in now anyway, so they're all ready to test. So they should be yeah, I've got, I've got the heel strikes really dialed in at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I've got one up from uh, James Earl on there. Um, what are your thoughts on the putter shaft developments in recent times? Um, I think it's it's an area that had been so explored so little. I think um, again, kind of weight balance point. It's distance control and strike consistency. It's just on a smaller scale, smaller level than mm. drivers, uh, but it's equally as important. I think there's you you need to change bigger changes to, to make the same kind of variable happen because there's less momentum. So, yeah. um, but I think, yeah, I think it, it's, it's like anything, it will have an effect. It's just whether again, it's good or bad for that player. For me, the, the composite structures in putter shafts, I lose the feel for the putter head, but then there are others who are more kind of dead hands and less art, which can work really well for. So um, it does change the balance in the feel particularly. And, and now they're going down, several of the manufacturers are going down their own shaft routes with different mm. tech. So yeah, I think it's, it's only going to get more and more prevalent. Yeah. And for yourself, you've got the good fitting studio upstairs where the Capto you use, I think, isn't it? So you've got yeah. all the data to yeah, back that's, up, that's which, which, yeah. yeah. What's going to, it's nice and visual that as well for the customer to come in and kind of see what's going on and what parameters are working nicely. Try not to show too, too many of those squares. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it can be a little bit <laughs> mind boggling sometimes, but the nice thing is there, I mean, like I said, we, uh, precision with yourselves it's not just the fitting bays that you've got I mean you kind of go through you've got obviously Kate's doing great with her with the gym in there as well there's a real holistic approach to to the actual site yeah we've got we've now now got uh, obviously Kate doing the, the the physical training side of it um and then we've got uh, Stuart Cartwright who does some coaching Stuart Robinson who does some therapeutic physical work so biomechanics and, and chiropractic therapy work um so being able to tie in the all sides of the playing of golf into into one bit. I guess you can argue the mental bit's the only bit that's not on site. But um, but it, like, like we were saying earlier about coaching and equipment, to have all sides communicating with one another, that's that's the bit that really starts to make the big gains because you've not got one. Let's say, for example, you know, um, Stuart used to say that um, it didn't work with Nick Dirty, and he was saying that the tour van, that the um, coach would be trying to teach one thing, and the physio is trying to trying to treat something, and actually the two things are just butting heads. So because there wasn't that communication, so to be able to get all all sides on the same wavelength on the same sheet, that that's really really key. Hmm. It's nice to like I say have it all all under one um, one roof as well. It just makes it mm. so you can yeah. kind of dive into different little bits from it as well. I think um, we're just kind of getting up to around about uh, an hour or so at the moment. So what I was going to look at doing, just like I say, just flick through, see if there's any kind of questions we can kind of go back mm. to or just finish off uh, in here. Uh, do you it's change interesting head... being on the bottom half of the screen at this time around. Yeah. I was in the top yeah. half. It's nice. I can <laughs> yeah. sit here and talk. <laughs> That's it, yeah. I'll do the questions. Uh, do you change head weight or shaft? Uh, process of putter fitting um, for example uh, even roll ER5 with pistol grip um, so I think for myself up there as well, I say you've got a, a variety of different shafts and shafts fit with different grips as well to change yeah and like with the full swing it, it's both um, yeah. there are I was even roll make some different fixed head weights um, and as long as you've got the examples to test with, you can, again, you can check those variables. I and mean, a bit of it is, is also, you know, having, letting people have fun with it, let them try stuff, you know, because if you don't try it, you don't know whether it works, especially with putting. Yeah. Um, there's a, an awful lot of, um, there's an awful lot in terms of visually, what can people line up correctly? That That's mm -hmm. a massive part of it. We all yeah. see things differently. We all, uh, you know, left, right, left, right, eye dominant, mm -hmm. um, you know, how you hold your head, angles like that. We all align things differently. So getting something you can actually line relatively straight is a great start point but then from there yeah you know the the balance and the weighting whether it's head weight or shaft weight determines your distance control and your start line control mm. so it, it's i guess a bit like anything it, it's very much i'm always going to say it's a case of definitely maybe on all counts because mm. um each aspect will change something for someone it's just whether it's the right change or the wrong change yeah um, so mm. Uh, I've got one on here. Uh, what are the benefits of an auto flex shaft for a slow swing golfer? I wonder when this will this will occur, that auto flex. Yeah. Um, it's, so auto flex is a really particular product. It's it's yeah. uh, it's got a lot of heat on it at the moment, and um, as I am Scott putting it in play a couple of weekends ago, got even more out of there. So it's it's a very very soft flexor shaft with high grade materials. Um, 
it's you know designer built in Korea. It's very much geared, in my opinion, it's very much geared towards the Asian market, which is more of a rotation based single plane, shallower swing plane profile mm -hmm. and a lesser club speed. Um, so the benefits would be, I mean, a, it's, it's high grade material. So whilst it's very soft, actually the stability and the dispersion control did seem very, very good with it. Um, but ultimately it's a mid to high fifties weight, slightly counterbalanced shaft. Um, it's not necessarily going to give you that much more than any other shaft would at that weight. Uh, and the feel of it is very, very unique. So what are the benefits? It's a great quality shaft. Uh, it's balance profile might help you move the head a little bit quicker and it will drain your wallet very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's great quality materials. So yeah, you, you couldn't get, what you pay you couldn't for get it, it that soft thing. without going good grade of material. Um, no. But it does have knock on ramifications for certain swing styles. Yeah. And it is that, especially when it comes to shaft, is it is mm. the, what you're paying for is the quality of the material. I mean, how many mm. times have you, I think uh, a fitter that I used to sort of see come up the club every now and again, always carried uh, an old Donne club that he had uh, had out the um, direct golf or somewhere saying sort of like pro stiff, sort of low torque, and you could just twist the thing around like this. Um and it's just again more resin rather than than anything else, really. Yeah, it's but I think, quality I think the, material. One thing, the one thing I would say to that is though is, is that you don't have to spend a lot of money for it to be right. No, a stock shaft can be the best shaft for someone. You know, they're, mm. they're nowhere near the the the, quali the poor quality that they used to be, um, mm. because uh, the brands can't get away with it now. But equally speaking, the materials available at the lower price points are that much better now as well. So mm. um, you don't have to search out the most expensive option. Um, it, it's, it can be that, that, yes, technically, you might get a bit more consistency of performance out of a Mitsubishi Diamana shaft versus the, the stock Project X Evenflow. Um, but it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to hit it 10 yards further. So I think yeah. that's probably one of the things I would say to people is that you don't, you don't have to necessarily spend that much, like mm. 400 pounds on a shaft, just because it happens to be the best materials it just might still not be the best for you. Mm. Um, so it just has to be right for you. Yeah, no, perfect. I've got uh, Valentino in here, I've out, mm. uh, sending the question, who's come to see you before? So he's been doing a bit of swing work with myself and obviously got his clubs all uh, sorted out and fitted up by yourselves there. Uh, how much do swing changes affect your equipment once fitted? So what it can change is if you've made a, a, a kind of a linkage change, or sort of a, a plane change, then it can affect the balance a little bit. It, it might be worth potentially revisiting and fine tuning head weight a little bit. In order to really change, certainly from an iron point of view, loft lie can require changing if your impact position changes a little bit. What, um, what it's not gonna change is the, the kind of the muscle groups you use, the way you generate your speed um, and generally the way your, your body functions it's not going to change that so actually the raw the raw components are unlikely to need to change um by very much at all sure. um if you if, if you get in the gym and put a lot of strength on then then yeah your the amount of energy going into the club changes and therefore chances are that the weight of the product needs to change uh, the, the base shaft weight will need to change the only thing that really can be affected are driver loft um sure. so if you change your your dynamic loft into impact, if you're hitting, if you were hitting down at two degrees, you then hit up and at a degree, then you might well need a different launch and spin profile out of the head itself or a slight fine tune on the shaft setup. But in the main, it doesn't have as big an effect as you might think. Cool, and then uh, one on here as well. Would standard clubs off the shelf be swing weighted? Yes. Uh, they will all be swing weighted, um, but they will, they're all swing weighted into a, a kind of average standard uh, mm. parameter. So um, they're, yeah, they'll all be swing weighted, but they won't be set up for you. They're just set up for Mr. or Miss Average. Yeah, um, whatever their spec sheet says on the website, that's a, what they said. Neutral, as neutral a setup, as, as inoffensive setup as they can make it, that's where it will be. Um, yeah. But yes, they, they will all be swing weighted in the factory. Cool. Well, I think we've got through all our uh, our questions now. Mm. So uh, thanks ever so much for Pleasure. joining with the, uh, the live. It's been great. So I say picking your brains for a bit and hopefully gets uh, 
just a lot of information to people that have been mm. listening in as to the detail and the knowledge and the, the technology and the product that goes into kind of uh, an expert fitting at somewhere like Precision Golf um, over um, say a, a standard fitting down the road and I think for me as well the big thing about it is is it just shows that for me I say don't don't be scared to pay for a fitting because knowledge like I said you, you've got knowledge you've got the experience and you, mm. you, there's a lot of stuff that goes into that whether it's the technology whether it's the product whether it's the the, the learning on the way um, and yeah and I think just I think that's one of the, one of the questions we do get asked is, is actually about is actually paying for the fitting and you know, do we refund it we don't refund our fitting fee you know we mm. we are not we're not afraid of saying we we value our time we charge for our time mm. because it's all I've done for the last 16 years. Yeah. And you know what, if, if I don't feel confident enough that my time is worth that, yeah. then we won't charge you for it. But, yeah. um, but equally speaking, as you say, don't be afraid of, of paying for it because actually in any other field, you would pay a specialist for their time and their expertise. Mm-hmm. And golf has, has not been good at that over the years. We always felt kind of afraid to charge people for our time. You know, we're, we're specialists in what we do. You're a specialist swing coach. You spend a lot of time learning and developing your knowledge, so quite quite rightly you charge for it. And and if someone's prepared to charge for their time, then actually your expectations for what you get out of it should be that bit higher as well. So mm-hmm. um, I'd I'd like to think that that people do expect a really kind of thorough and quality service from us based on the fact that we do actually charge for our time. Yeah, and it's the experience of going there. And like we said earlier, it's it's about the knowledge of what you can learn going there. It almost is like a coaching session, three and a half hours with an industry expert. I mean, it's, it's, it's great value. Rather than if you try to say, let's say, okay, well, I want to go and spend half a day with Pete Cowan, it's going to cost you a lot more than a fitted would do. Yeah, and I think, um, as you say, it's just, I think it's where expectations have been over the years. And, and actually, you know, we're, you know, we've spent a lot of time and, and put a lot of energy into developing the knowledge and getting the tech in, having the options there to test out. Researching yourself as well. Mm. That's the thing, so, the amount of hours you guys spend researching. Um, so like I say, I think for anyone watching, feel free to want more information or like I say, get a fitting yeah. in with, with Simon and the boys up there, reach out to myself, reach out to Simon on our Instagram page, mm. you're all on here and um, we'll, uh, we'll get you hooked up and out on the fairways. Hopefully we'll all be out on the fairways yeah. fairly soon. Yeah. But, uh, see, fingers see crossed. See some other faces, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Rolling them through the phone in person would be nice, wouldn't it? It'd be, it'd be the most enjoyable bad round of golf I've played for a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Perfect. So great stuff. Really, really oh, enjoyable. And uh, look forward to catching up with you again soon. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Cheers, Bye. Care.